by forensic psychologist Sarah Soderlund and paranormal investigator David Erickson. State of Mind is a show that features mentalism, mystery, and modern psychology with twists of cognitive process and challenges of the mind. News, discoveries, banter, and guests that talk all things fascinating. Join them every Tuesday at 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern, only on ParamaniaRadio.com. want to hear different viewpoints on the spirit world then join alan cox as he talks with his guests about their beliefs experiences and delve into a diverse view of life and the afterlife join alan cox for understanding spirit every thursday at 4 p.m eastern 9 p.m greenwich mean time here on the paramania radio network Views expressed and the opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Paramania, its affiliates, or its sponsors. You are listening to Paramania Radio. Parasearch UK radio show with your hosts Kerry Greenaway and Jay Lynch right here on Paramania Radio. Good evening everyone and welcome back to the Parasearch UK radio show. I am your normal co-host Jay but there's I'm... nothing normal about you. No, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I had to. Of course. Oops. So, well, normally we have Miss Carrie Greenaway with us, but she's feeling slightly under the weather tonight, so she's not going to be joining uh, join us tonight. So, But we are joined by Teresa and Dr. Dave and our absolutely wonderful guest, Mr. Andy Mercer. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. And and now I back out let them take over the show. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you don't get out that easy. You. Right? <laughs> no. Can't escape. We, we've known Andy for a little bit now because we've met him through the Parasearch uh, Radio Network. And and, uh, and he's actually – one of the reasons we have him on tonight he, is you've just written a book, another book. Indeed, yes. This is um, my third. This is with a, a new publisher on a slightly different topic. It's still with the world of the esoteric and occult, as you guys know. It's one of my sort of main interests, and it's a kind of area I write about. But this is um, – this one's a little bit different. <clears throat> Do you want me to tell you the whole story behind it? or? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, how? I, I mean, that's what I was going to really ask. In what direction is it different than the other two? Okay, well, this will probably be the rest of the show covered because it's quite a story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, let me start from the very beginning of how the whole idea of this book came up before I tell you what it's actually about. I was at a, a book launch a couple of years ago, launched uh, by a friend of mine who'd written a book on basically East Anglian witchcraft and magic. Now, as you probably realise, there's quite a revival these days of, of witchcraft, not just the, the Wiccan movement, which most people have probably heard of, started by Gerald Gardner in the 1950s, but almost as a, a kind of reaction to that has been the growth of what's called traditional witchcraft, which is still a little bit contrived, it's still a bit invented, but it, it tries to adhere a bit more to more traditional witchcraft ideas, if you like, whereas it's controversial, Gerald Gardner, some would say, including myself, that pretty much all made up by Gerald. He claimed to be in communication with ancestral witches in his area, that some of the stuff in his wicker ideas come from there but others would say well you know there's not a lot of historical evidence that these people existed and that by and large you may have made some of it up in fact we made quite a lot of it up. 
So as a, a kind of reaction to that, there has been this rise, as I say, of what's called traditional witchcraft, which tries to adhere more to historic examples of witchcraft. And when well, I say witchcraft, I don't mean sort of old hags on broomsticks. So there's some of the element in there. But rural folk magic, should we say, the folk magic of the countryside, that's, that's more accurate. But it's still, to some degree, synth- synthetic. It's a collection of ideas that are brought together and systematized to become a system of working with magic um if you think of wicca has become now an established religion it's actually got religious status in this country and other countries around the world so it does have a belief system of ideas of gods and goddesses etc involved with it but if you think of traditional witchcraft it's more of a kind of a practical approach it's kind of more down to earth and one of the things that's not that uncommon is to find someone who'd be practicing a particular religion, Christianity, if you like, or Buddhism even, but still consider themselves to practice traditional witchcraft because it's a more of a down, get down dirty kind of thing. It's actually practical, what we call operative magic. It's the way in which you really do work stuff. Now, so my friend's book was about his experiences of working with traditional witchcraft. It's based around East Anglia, which is the southeast of, of Great Britain. It's my count, home county is on the periphery of that. We're kind of somewhere between uh, East Anglia and London. We're kind of Essex sort of splits between the two, if you like. A lot of it's sort of London based, but there is a lot of rural territory out here as well. So there is a history of witchcraft in this particular part of the country. So my friend's book was more that kind of synthetically sort of put together based on not real ideas. But I was at the book launch and he had a, a few speakers talking about various topics to do with witchcraft and magic and talking about, not so my friend was actually launching his book and read from his book. But one of the other speakers noted that we... Um, a missing sort of a lot of history of actual real written down examples of historic folklore and magic, actual books of magic, if you like. They they would have existed, often called a commonplace or a black book or a book of shadows is a modern name. It's that kind of thing where you collect together your own personal grimoire, which is um, a term used for magic or spell books. And, Though there are examples, particularly in Scandinavia and Northern Europe, that still exist, which are called the Schwarzenbock, or the Schwarzenbocker, which is the black book, which isn't literally a book that's black, although sometimes they were, but it's a book of spells, if you like. And there are various examples that have been published fairly recently, both in Europe and some from in America, although they're European books that have been published by a company called Three Hands Press. But there are English versions of such books that are written about, but they all seem to have disappeared. They don't know where they are. There's titles that books have, things like The Devil's Plantation, which is the title my friend had used for his book, but there is a real book supposed to exist called The Devil's Plantation. There's The Red Book of Appin. There's um, The the Secret Granary. These are all titles that we know about, but no one knows what's happened to them. They've disappeared. They've been lost. And it would be a real shame that you can't find such titles. Now, On the other side of this, I have here at home quite a large collection of books on folklore. Now, folklore and sort of magic and witchcraft it was a really a popular subject for the Victorians in the sort of late 1800s. And there's a uh, society called the Folklore Society that regularly produce um, booklets and full on books, which are collections of myths and legends and stories from the countryside that these uh, uh, Victorian folklorists would go out into the country and record the stories from the villages nearby and things like ghost stories, of course, that we're all familiar with, um, legends and tales and mysteries and intrigue but they'd also occasionally record actual spells spells and incantations that were used by the local villagers either often to oppose witchcraft and magic so the sort of thing that would be used by what's known as a cunning man who was the guy who would try to dispel bad witches and bad magic and these books themselves although quite lengthy and sometimes quite dry and boring to read but they did also include the actual written spells that would have been certainly recorded in the Victorian age where these books came from, but they obviously went further back and you couldn't even know the antiquity of some of these um, spells and charms. Sometimes by the way they were worded, you knew they were good two, 300 years old and more often than not, they've been passed down just through generations spoken, if you like, and may have been written down in private diaries. But unfortunately the, the actual Victorian folklorists didn't recall exactly where they got these spells from so it's a bit of a mystery in itself but it seemed to be they were just talking to the locals in the villages now, if you think in the victorian times even in the uk which 
a country wise is quite small compared to America, but yet, you know, still traveling from town to town could take quite some time mm. before the advent of the railways everywhere. You were covering by sort of horse or horse and cart. So often small rural communities might only be a few miles apart, but have, may often have very little to do with each other and no real communication. So this is like a, a local tradition that was still alive and was operating right under the Victorian age and often more recently as well. But I thought you could take these folklore books, and I've got over 40 of them sort of sitting around in my bookcase, and work through them and find these spells and charms and incantations, the sort of things that would have been recorded in these now lost black books. So the project became basically to compile um, a genuine black book of magic. Black in the sense of that's what they describe the books, not book of evil. I mean, well, you could argue that some of the spells are a bit unpleasant, but it wasn't supposed to be like a book of black magic, evil, dark Satan stuff. It was rural <laughs> folk magic. <laughs> what? No evil demonic things? I know I had to well, throw actually, the D word in there. Two in there. <laughs> I had there to throw that D word in there for you. Well, some of it is battling against predominantly it's people against people. It's breaking the charm of a black witch who's caused the, the cow to stop producing milk and that kind of thing. Now most of the spells that I found are actually very benign things like, you know, producing more crops or um, make producing better milk. Or the most common one by far, rather boring really, was to find out one's true love, who's going to be your husband or wife and how to find them and how to lure love and charm to you. So most of the charms were like that, which was pretty boring, to be perfectly honest with you. But scattered amongst them were much more interesting books with um, interesting spell titles. And I'll sort of bring up a couple of names for you, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that I actually found within mm -hmm. these, because there are some very interesting topics that are covered. You have spells for things like um, protection and defense, for recovery and revenge, charms requiring the aid of the dead, charms to make and break curses, charms to help with the healing of wounds, to control the elements, and of course, charms to summon and dispel ghosts and spirits. There were in there these much more interesting charms, things to sort of battle against the omens of death and all that kind of stuff, the real kind of nitty-gritty kind of fascinating stuff. But as far as I can see, nobody had ever compiled these together into one book, just a collection of all these more mysterious, more sinister charms. So... Essentially, that's what the book was about. And I'll pause for a moment there, because you must have some questions by now. <laughs> <laughs> Dave? Teresa? Teresa's got one. Well, Go I do. It. I'm sitting, I'm actually intently listening, because I am You're very interested to. in this. Then order his book. What's the so, name? So, well, I will. You're, you're trying. I, w I just want to make sure I'm right. Mm -hmm. There were several books that have been lost throughout time. Yes. That you have been, that people know about, yeah. but they can't prove that they were there. Yes, they get so, mentioned in things like diaries and country file type books. Right. You have, right. And, but no one knows what's happened to them, whether they've been sitting in someone's loft somewhere or something like that. It's quite possible. So what, you're, what you've done is you're going through the folklore books that you do have Mm -hmm. and, and making a combined book. Yes. That, it, it, But you keep calling it a, a black book, but it, like yeah. you said, it does not have anything to do with dark magic. No, it's the term that was given to these books. They're not even... Uh, it's a funny kind of mixture because the ones in the UK aren't necessarily black in terms of physically black, you know, black book cover. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. Scandinavian versions that do exist, and thankfully a lot of them have survived. In fact, one turned up only about a dozen or so years ago in the house of a woman who was had passed away and her granddaughter, I think, was just clearing out the loft in, um, I think it was Norway. It was either Norway or Denmark, but she came across this little black book. It was physically black, black cover, black leather cover. And that one was published fairly recently. And there's a couple of others that have cropped up. There's a, a guy done a lot of research on them, which produced a book called The Solomonic Black Arts. Now, again, the term black is being used, but it doesn't mean satanic, evil, nastiness. It's not that kind of thing. But the publisher of the Salomonic Black Arts, which is a very good book indeed, is a company called Three Hands Press. So having compiled these, this book, it didn't really fit in with the sort of thing my current publisher normally publishes. It's more of a different era of the occult. So I thought I'd give um, 
Three Hands Press a try. Now, they are probably one of the, the premier publishers of these kinds of books in, that are currently working. So I thought, well, that would be rather nice to be published by them. And they absolutely loved it. So it was a great idea. And um, oh. at the moment, it's still sitting with them, just waiting for the go for the sort of prim- final proofreading. And it should be out before the end of the year. But you know how things can be with publishing, unfortunately. It can be a bit slow. So, so what's it, the title in, of the book? Yeah. The book title is The Wicked Shall Decay. Now, the reason for that is um, that was actually a lesson of the publisher, and it's actually part of the wording of one of the spells. So it seems like absolutely a perfect choice for the wording. I'll just quickly call up the spell itself. So I thought I'd, I'd give you a few examples of the spells that we've actually in my book. Just waiting for this thing to load up. We should have loaded earlier, but it didn't load, and now it's finally working. Typical. Ah, there <laughs> we go. Um, let's have a look at it. There it is. Okay, here is an example of one of the spells that produced the title for the book. This is a a way of breaking a spell that's been cast against you. So, as the fire do melt the wax, melting wax candle, Mm -hmm. and the wind does blow smoke away, so in the presence of the Lord, the wicked shall decay. The wicked shall decay. Amen. So you find a lot of these spells, like the title of my book, do invoke religious ideas as well. It's not just a case of, you know, the the darker stuff. As I say, there's a lot of the a strong Christian element influence, you should say, in a lot of these titles, which is quite interesting when you think it's witchcraft and magic. But it, it's one of those things that I've noticed also in um, the American folk magic, which is known as the power or Pennsylvania Deutsch magic, that, again, you get a lot of spells and charms that are recorded, but the people recording them are very much Christian. You know, they they see no problem between you know going out and casting spells or breaking spells, and also attending church on a Sunday. They, they see no conflict or contradiction in that. And it is a relatively recent idea that you know a Christian would never do anything to do with magic at all. The today it's very clearly defined difference, but not so long ago it was very much a blurred line between the two. And often these sort of cunning men were doing stuff. With, as they would see it, as things that the, the vicar wouldn't do, wouldn't go near, because they would uh, be concerned by it. But the cunning man or wise woman would be prepared to do the work of God, if you like, to break this dark magic that's been used mm-hmm. against people. So there's basically, if if you wanted to, so say, say somebody wanted to ask for your help, mm-hmm. and they could come to you for just about anything and you could either a give them the spell to help them Mm -hmm. or b cast said spell that would be or does it does that need to come from the person that's wanting the spell well generally speaking historically it would be that you would say for example i'm the cunning man i'm the local kind of wise cunning man of the village you can break Mm -hmm. spells and cause things you'd come to me for my aid now i would either come to your place and cast the anti-witchcraft spell because a lot of these spells are recorded are anti-spells they're, they're breaking sort of negative problems or perhaps okay. they might produce a particular item for you which of course you pay for whether i come to your house or not or right. whatever i give you pay for that so i make my living but generally speaking yeah you wouldn't necessarily be the spell cast yourself because the, the wise man or cunning man would be seen as having magical power in itself So they would use their inherent power to be able to break the spell that's been used against you. So so a lot of the ones I collect and a lot of the ones that are recorded are anti-witchcraft spells. There weren't a lot that we'd say we'd use by witches. There are a few examples I came across. But that would be how it would work. So then with an anti-spell like that, Mm -hmm. it's you could definitely, in case anybody's listening and has any questions, that would be considered something to the good. Oh, absolutely, you could, yeah. If someone's home has been stricken with illness or um, they're, like you said, the cows have, have dried up, the hens won't lay, you know, things of that nature. That's what they would come to you for. Absolutely, um, yeah. That was, that would a be streak your, of bad luck. 
Yep. I mean, you could argue that perhaps sometimes people might put out the um, the idea that there was a problem and that you'd have to then almost like create your own work. You know, suddenly the, the cows aren't um, working properly, then that means there must be a curse against the cow. Therefore, you need my help to fix it for you. You know, it's kind of almost self-creating the work. <laughs> sometimes you might even put out a story that a witch had done something e- evil in the village. And then that kind of spreads around to other people. And, of course, they find they're having the same problem and you they call out the, the cunning man or the practitioner of magic to, to break that spell for you so sometimes they might I like how you word that work. the cunning man i like that yep that was the term that was used it was the cunning wiseness there's, there's the various explanations for, for how that term came about but cunning as in wise as in knowing the ways of the land is the, is the right. version i like I mean, there's a, a version called the cuning which is some kind of medieval term that it might have been derived from that's to do with magic again but i much prefer the idea of the cunning the wise cunning man <laughs> yeah but now how can you say say you know, I've fallen and, and broken my foot and my cow's milk has dried up and the well dried up or whatever. There's just like a streak of bad luck. Mm-hmm. Would I just Where assume I? that it was a witch's spell and come to seek the cunning man? Or, would- or, or, is, there, or is there a way to tell that you have been... A spell has been cast on you. The argument would be that there are methods and means by which you can discover whether a spell has been cast or not. Again, it would often be in the interest of the wise woman or canny man to say that, yes, you have been cursed and you need my help. So, you know, they might devise a method that would demonstrate for definite that, okay. you know, absolutely you're going to need my help. But um, it was often taken as an assumption that, you know, in the world we live today, we're very, uh, even in America, we're much more secular than we used to be, that we tend to think of scientific rational explanations first and foremost. Even us ghosty people tend to, you know, we'll, we'll look for the rational first before leaping on the ghost. Right. But right. if you imagine not that long ago, science didn't exist as such. They, you know, in terms of rural communities, they had no notion of it. So the idea of the day-to-day influence and effect of supernatural forces was far more powerful, more prevalent. And, you know, if you suddenly befell two or three things go wrong at the same time, the chances are the first thing you think of is is witchcraft against you rather than look for more rational explanation you know if the cows have suddenly stopped milking and you have suddenly had an accident and something's suddenly gone missing all at the same time and you think oh you know what's going on here they think there's something going wrong so you're calling your local um, wise woman cunning man and um, ask them to investigate and chances are there's think well you know i've got a few quid here yeah of course you've been cursed definitely right. to fix this problem for you <laughs> so i mean they're not you know i'm not saying they're all crooks and criminals but they were you know again the day in those sort of days you're living in absolute poverty if you don't have any income you know there's no nowhere nothing to save you well, obviously we have the welfare state here you guys have something over there that means don't completely fall through the cracks so they, of course some people right. do but in those days there was nothing nothing to sort of keep the the walls from the door as it were so if you had a reputation of being able to fix charms and deal with problems of course you might claim there's a problem there in the first place in order for you to fix it it's a bit like in you know, a garage you take your, your car into a garage because it's got a flat tire the next thing you know you need to replace all four wheels you know? <laughs> that right kind of and thing. the brakes and <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> all of it now is there any correlation between um witchcraft and superstition Oh, totally. Absolutely. And again, you can say that that's the origin of most superstitions is the idea that you're trying to ward off bad spirits or bad problems. One of the common things I came across was spells against the evil eye. The idea of being overlooked by something that, you know, if you catch the wrong eye of a witch or if something else even, you know, you can get the evil eye upon you and that becomes a, a powerful curse. So people would fear such simple things like that. So superstition is intricately, intricately tied in with that kind of thing, you know do a certain thing a wrong way and these bad things that happen and probably one of the common ones you know about is things like you smash a mirror seven years bad luck but you right. can have that bad luck streak broken by someone who's wise in the powers of magic you know that kind of thing obviously things like black cats were a popular uh, a superstition about them crossing your path and that kind of thing so 
sometimes the superstitions would be useful because they then create a need for someone to break the superstition, to break the effect of the su- of the of a superstition. And again, you're coming back to people producing charms and trinkets to protect you. A common practice would be with spells, particularly if you were going to give it to somebody who more often than not couldn't read, was to write it for them and then sort of place it perhaps in a leather pouch. They keep it on themselves and perhaps wear it around their neck or secrete it somewhere in their body, the actual written word. One of the most common examples... If they couldn't that, read, why why give them the written word? Because they didn't have to read it then, just having the words within themselves oh, okay, would produce okay. the protection. But like, you know, some people say just having the Bible with you can actually act as a protection. That was a common one as well, that you'd have a holy book with you at all time. It, it was almost like a magical shield that was around you. Um, one of the most common examples of that is something called the abracadabra, which has been often appears in films these days. The words abracadabra is a classic sort of magician would say, waving his magic wand over the top hat to produce the rabbit. But abracadabra goes back into ancient antiquity, and what happens is you start off with a full word abracadabra, and you rem- remove letters at each end, so you work right down to the last individual letter. And the idea is that as you work down it, reduce the number of letters so the spell itself breaks. Sometimes the letters were taken from each end and sometimes they're taken from just the end of abracadabra. So you work your, right, work your way right down to just the letter A. And when you reach that point, the idea is the spell would then be broken. So that, that was a fairly common charm that people would, say, have with them or carry about with them. In fact, there's a, an old tale from Cornwall about how you'd have to go and see a particular magician to get the abracadabra renewed every so often. And of course, you have to have it paid to be renewed. So, again, another clever way of earning a few extra pence. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Now, there's a question in the chat room. Nope. Um, they want to know would being a cunning man be an inherited position, or is this something you learn to do to become a cunning man or woman? Well, the answer to that is yes, on both counts. Certainly some would claim to be absolutely um, born of a family of magicians. And that's understandable. You have the old seventh son of the seventh son. That's another claim of natural inherited magic. But again, often a generational thing like with witchcraft. But there are also some of the most famous examples of cunning men, one man in particular who I'm very fascinated by, a chap called um, James Cunning Murrell. There was no prehistory in his family at all. In fact, it wasn't until he moved to London from my home county of Essex that when he returned, he then seemed to possess some enormous magical skills. So it would seem. And um, again, there was no history in his family, as far as we know, of anything about him sort of family being magical. But yet, he was definitely probably became one of the most famous cunning men in the country a genuine i should say famous cunning man because there's another guy called george pickingill which i have um talked about on other occasions on this network about how he has become seen as the father of wicker and that goes back to talk, let's talk about at the beginning but james murrell was certainly a man who had no antecedents in his family of magic yet he clearly seemed to possess certain skills that were undeniable in the sense that it appeared to work now appeared is the important word here we, we don't know from this distance we're talking about mid 1800s you know it could all be charlatanism and complete fraud or it could be that he genuinely had some kind of magical ability i don't know you know we could only go by the stories and tales that were told of him some do seem quite fantastic and others seem maybe possible and along the more fantastic tales is how he disappeared from a castle in um, hadley where he lived and appeared on the other side of the thames in the county of kent which is about 40 miles away directly 14 rather to say but would have been a a round trip about 50 miles to get without a boat to kent and then seemed to come back almost at the same time almost like he was teleporting which you know seems a little unlikely but that's one of the stories and tales about him his most common method of dispelling witchcraft acts against people was what was called the witch bottle now the witch bottle itself has its history of its own going back to the 1600s which they were used often as a protection against um, witchcraft and they contain items of um, bodily fluids and nails and hair clippings etc which were then placed under the threshold of a house for protection but Cunning Morrell came up with a rather interesting different way of using them to break again anti-witchcraft 
to break spells being cast upon people. And his witch bottles were made of iron, whereas the others previously been made mainly of clay. His art one was made of iron and was put together by the local blacksmith, who would he would then place within the iron bottle um, pieces of hair or clothing that had been taken from the witch who'd apparently cast a spell. The bottle was then loosely sealed and placed on a fire, and the bottle would obviously get hot and begin to warm up and would explode and the idea was that the spell could be broken at the moment the bottle exploded but there were supposedly recorded examples of where the witch herself would drop dead at the explosion of the bottle on one particular oh. occasion so the story goes that there was a, a man Morrow was in this house with his husband and wife who thought had been cursed by a witch and as the bottle was heating up there was a banging banging on the front door and then Morrow said don't answer it it's her she wants to be saved but don't we're going to break this spell and effectively the bottle explodes and she dropped dead at the front door so so the story goes again it's a story it's a legend we don't know the definite truth of it but as a slightly amusing side note it doesn't Magic doesn't necessarily travel through the family because one of James's son, Buck Murrell, decided to carry on his father's practice of making witchcraft bottles to break local spells and charms. Unfortunately, the bottles were made by a different blacksmith to the one that Murrell had used, and the blacksmith made the bottles rather too well because when the bottle exploded on one occasion he tried to use it, the explosion actually ripped half the house down <laughs> and blew the entire chimney Damn. off and actually Damn. wrecked the house. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> he, he quickly gave up magic at that point and found another life. I think he's a cobbler or a tailor or something. But yeah, so there's a good example where magic doesn't necessarily become inherited. <laughs> I guess not. Now, what would you what would you suggest to someone? This is this is slightly off the topic of your book too, but what would you suggest sure. to someone if they are? Where would you suggest someone to start if they were interested in witchcraft? Mm, uh, well, wait a question. minute, wait a minute. Someone that has an English background? It's, this is more of a personal question, isn't it? You start with this book. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> I'm, I'm just asking where to, what would point A be? Um, that's a difficult one, to be honest, to be honest. It, it, Hmm. I mean, there are certainly very good books out there. Well, there's a couple that I would probably recommend. First and foremost, by someone I actually know, I've got to know fairly well, actually. Well, a correspondent occasionally, you should say. Don't exaggerate. Um, a woman called Gemma Gary has written a book called um, it's Cornish Witchcraft, A Traditional Book of Ways. That's a really good starting point for, for traditional witchcraft. I mean, the watchword is look for that title, traditional witchcraft. There are a few writers in the field... Um, that are, are worth exploring. But I think probably Gemma Gary's um, A Cornish Book of Ways is probably one of the best ones to start with as a general kind of idea of how it, it works, if you like. If okay. you want to go down the path of Wicca, then there are lots and lots of books on Wicca. And I, I, I'll be honest, I don't necessarily recommend Wicca because it has become a religion. And, you know, if you want to be able to separate your sort of magical interest from religious interest, then Wicca is probably not the best place to go. I'm a bit biased. I'm not, I'm not a big fan to be perfectly honest with you. But again, you know, it, it's a starting point. But I think the problem is sometimes things get taken a little bit too literally, a bit too kind of over the top. And, you know, a lot of it is about finding your own way, finding your own path that works for you. But certainly something like Jim McGarry's, um traditional witchcraft, a Cornish book of ways would be a good starting point. So just put Gemma Gary into Google. You'll soon find her. She's written a number of very good books, actually, Troy books are an English company. And to be perfectly honest with you, if Three Hands Press hadn't gone for my book, she was the next port of call. <laughs> oh, wow. But they well, they actually they had actually brought two books out around the same time I was working on mine that wasn't a million miles away from what I've written. They Gemma's got quite a good link with the um, Boscast Museum of Witchcraft down in Cornwall, which is internationally famous. But and they've produced a couple of books of spells and charms from their own collection. Whilst it's not quite the same source of material I've been using. The books weren't, aren't a million miles away from what I was talking about, so I thought I'd better to go to somebody who was um, not so connected, if you like, with something of that recent era, but that was more connected in the more general witchcraft, traditional witchcraft area, which the Hands Press are more predominantly. Um, so 
answer the question really would be i would say Gemma mcgarry's um first book she wrote the, the traditional witchcraft cornish book of ways is a good place to start but there are a number of good publishers the ones to look out for good publishers people like troy books who Gemma mcgarry's on three hands press who i'm now with the books that they're producing are of a good quality they're the good kind stuff um michael howard is another very good writer in the area he's written quite a few books unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago quite young um it's not the michael howard who used to be an mp over here by the way sometimes that gets confused it's a different person altogether um his <laughs> books michael howard is well worth getting hold of certainly the last name was howard yes michael howard <laughs> that was my maiden name Oh right, okay. <laughs> Maybe you're connected. You never know. That yeah. could be. I do. My roots do go back to England, so. Oh blimey! Do you know roughly whereabouts? No, I'm not sure on that. My, oh. I know my uncle did an extensive um, history. Um, Catherine Howard was related. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes, that's a rather famous name, certainly. Right. <laughs> there was. <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to remember, there were three well-known people in the family tree. There was Catherine Howard, um, William Shakespeare, and Jesse James. Don't blow me. <laughs> so that was the three. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite a collection. It got, is, isn't it? <clears throat> I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nor have I, Jay. I don't know. I have no relations that I know of particularly. I like to claim that Colonel James Cullen Merrill was my adopted great grandfather. That's my, my, <laughs> my the, the, claim like, personally. When we first met with you guys, that the only thing, thing that we can claim on my side of the family is that Thomas uh, Lynch Jr. signed the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. So uh, my oh, family is one of the original something. outlaws. <laughs> right. Well, that's something at least. <laughs> yeah, we're the original American outlaws. We go way back to the beginning. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, but, but that's kind of getting way off topic now. It is. It no is way. Right. Not us. But, <laughs> Say it's not uh, so. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Harry's so not we, here to punish me. No, I know. <laughs> yes, uh, the school mistress is missing. We're in trouble now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> She's always track. good for keeping you on task. Absolutely. Yes. Reeling it back. So, in. Um, well, yeah, the book itself is due out later this year. Well, hopefully before Christmas, That that's the plan. At least, as usual, it'll come out directly through, from Three Hands Press, and then we may be available more generally in bookstores, which is quite nice, because they said they're, they're quite a big company, so they get themselves into a lot more of the, the mainstream bookstores as well. And um, it's actually available for pre-order on Amazon, so if you go to Amazon, you'll find the Wicked Shoulder Case available. Just put that in and you'll find it. And um, you might also find my other two books, which I can talk about a bit if you want me to. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about my book, which really was quite a surprise. I was um, delving through these various books, as I say, trying to find useful stuff to go in my book. And I came across a full-blown exorcism, which was really quite surprising. It's a layman's exorcism. doesn't necessarily require the aid of the church. You can do it yourself. And um, I'm just going to bring it up because... Reading through, you found it was very much the standard language you would expect to find in uh, the Catholic version and calling up the usual names that you expect to find. But there was one name that absolutely really surprised me as it came across it. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, there we go. Ooh, lost it. There we go. It disappeared. Come back. There we go. Um, again, the wording is all there, the usual kind of things, Lord Jesus Christ, etc., etc., in the name of this angel and that angel. And I came across this line in the exorcism that was very, very surprising. The line goes, I exercise and conjure, I invoke and command thee, thou foresaid spirit, by the power of the angels and the archangels. Kind of almost medieval language, but it's in kind of with the, the Catholic version of mm -hmm. exorcism. You get the the archangels, the cherubim and the seraphim, and the, by the mighty prince, Coronzom. And I thought, hang on a minute, Coronzom is a very specific name. It, yes, doesn't it, appear, well, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. It's not a biblical name at all. The only other recorded occasion where that name appears is in the work of an Elizabethan magician, scholar, friend of Elizabeth I, called Dr. John Dee. 
Now, that it takes me straight back to my first book, which is about what's called Enochian magic. And the title of the book is Liber Coronzom. Coronzom is this energy entity being whatever you want to call it don't call it demon that um <laughs> they were communicated about or d was communicating with angelic forces that knew of coronzom now coronzom himself has been thought of as being a version of samael which is the jewish name for satan although again it's not necessarily correct there's a big debate about that bit but what was really strange was to find this rural handwritten or if you like um exorcism that was mentioning a name that you thought how on earth could you possibly have known about it the only time the name coronzom has ever appeared in print in physical print is in a book published in 1649 which is a collection of john d's personal diaries transcribed very very badly into a book the book itself, the true and faithful relation of what passed for many years between Dr. John D. and some spirits, is very limited production, produced in, say, in the 1659, and was only available for sale outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And yet this bell, or this exorcism, I should say, that mentioned Coronzom, was written, was from Yorkshire, which... Okay, in the scale of America, it doesn't seem very far away from London, but for something of at least Victorian, if not older, it's about 400 miles. And it is a hell of a long way for that name to have travelled by itself. And I was absolutely intrigued. It just didn't seem to make sense to me. How on earth did this name crop up in this rural, um, handwritten um, exorcism? It was just very, very strange. I was really surprised by it. And I say that... The whole John D. communications with angelic beings itself is quite a long story. I have um, talked about it on another show before, another Parasite show a long while ago. In a nutshell, Dr. John D. was living in the 1500s, so a good 300 years before this book, this um, spell was produced. He was, uh, say, a close friend of Queen Elizabeth I. He was uh, her advisor on all sorts of matters of science and astrology as well as astronomy. And he probably invented the term the British Empire. And his part of his book collection became the foundations of the British Library. So he's pretty influential. Um, he was a very knowledgeable man. He had knowledge of maths and science and physics, chemistry, all those sorts of things, but wanted to know more about fundamentally how the world and the universe worked and he came to the conclusion that the only way he was going to find out more information was basically talk to god have a phone conversation with god but basically was the idea now of course how in the 1500s do you communicate with god but the most common way of doing that was divination now we use divination today to talk about predicting the future from tarot cards crystals or runes or all those sort of things but divination is actually the communication with the divine is its real origin of it so you're trying to learn of things of the future from the divine i.e from god and the most common way in those days was crystal ball gazing or scrying as it's also known mm -hmm. where you look into the crystal ball and look to see what kind of things you can learn through the crystal ball now d himself had a go at doing this and was useless he couldn't see a damn thing he had no no ability whatsoever <laughs> but much like the cunning men we were talking about before there were people who sort of go around the countryside who could potentially see things in crystal balls see spirits and angels and that sort of thing and he employed the help of one person called barnabas saul at first but again Saul didn't reproduce very much at all and then quite out of the blue a chap called Edward Kelly turned up and Kelly seemed to have the absolute gift of this he could see all sorts of strange and wonderful remarkable things in this crystal ball and what happened was Kelly would see stuff explained explain to D what he was seeing and D would write it down now it is a long story about how this all came about but through these communications with something whatever it was now they could they said they were angels but when you look at in more detail what these things supposedly claim it doesn't fit with any kind of idea of angels that we have it's not not evil monsters or anything like that it was just different it was very strange I mean there are elements that you would recognize if you knew um, Hinduism for example the belief systems in there that were similar to the kind of things these spirits are talking about other things that fitted more with old testament judaism things like you know jesus wasn't the son of man he's just a man etc it was things like that quite different quite strange but amongst that they talked about the enochian entities and they weren't called enochian they were called something else they were called angelic beings but there were various beings that they said that they you could that d and kelly could communicate with so one set of angels was telling them how to communicate with another set of angels but one of the angels that they could communicate 
with that was mentioned was Coronzon. But he's only mentioned the one time. And it's kind of a bit of a mystery, actually, as it appears in the diaries. It's almost like out of the blue, this mighty Prince Coronzon, that mighty devil, devil spelt with a two L's and an E. It's got a slightly different meaning to the standard devil that we would know today. It's um, more about a demonic, but not dark, evil Satan demonic. It's more kind of, yeah, it's a powerful force you don't want to, you don't want to pee off, basically. It's more like that. It's like the big tough guy you don't want to annoy. And, as I say, so it's pretty obscure reference in this book, appearing just the once in the communications, and for it to turn up in this sort of rural exorcism was just really strange. And I've got no explanation for it. I've no idea how or why it appeared, but it certainly is there quite clearly. Prince Coronzom. The only slight difference is that Coronzom in D is spelled with a Z, whereas this is spelled with an S in the middle of the name. Just to give you the spelling, so people can get it ahead, it's C R O. N S O N. Now, in the True and Faithful Relation book, that S is written as a Z. But Z is quite an unusual letter. It's not very common at all. So the chances are whoever transcribed this from perhaps the True and Faithful Relation book didn't recognize a Z and put an S because that's the, they didn't understand what that letter was, but it looked a bit like an S back to front. So they just wrote it as an S. So that's the interesting thing is the really fascinating thing for me is the, the True and Faithful Relation book ends in an N, whereas D's diaries, the actual written diaries, ends with the letter M, M for mother. So this person has clearly seen, has to have seen True and Faithful Relation, the book. And yet, as I say, it's like, you know, it's very, very rare, very physically large, but very rare and very expensive book. So I find it amazing that it ended up being written down in this exorcism. I'd just love to know where it originally came from. I've tried to track it further back because the book I've got is produced in the Victorian time. And there are some vague references to another book written in the 1700s that this is supposedly been taken from, but I've never been able to track down that book, unfortunately. But it was just unexpected and quite fascinating to find this name suddenly turn up. Yeah. Now, do you think it, I mean, Obviously, it was it was word of mouth or passed down, mm-hmm. you know, from person to person. Um, maybe somebody was around when it was first being talked about. They well, carried this story or this name with them because it meant something when they went four hundred miles away. I don't know. That's the thing. It's really hard to say. I think whoever wrote this um, exorcism must have at least had access to a copy of True and Faithful Relation. And of all the hundreds of strange spirit names that are in there, I mean, there are hundreds of them. Some of them are almost are unpronounceable. They're like a series of consonants. So you can't even print consonants as in, not vowels, not consonants as in America. Um, so you can't pronounce them. This is one of the few that's very clearly written down, but it's one of the very few that's directly named. So it's an odd one that they would pick up on this particular name. And as I say, you'd have to have been able to read the book to even understand what that word meant or even recognize the word. So it is a bit strange. I'm, I'm trying to think of a modern parallel and I'm, you know, having real trouble. It's like finding out, I don't know, your next door neighbor happened to have gone to the moon. You know? <laughs> right. The, the, right. You know, one of the NASA astronauts went to the moon. You say, oh, you're my neighbor. And you went to the, went to the moon. You know, it's that kind of unlikeliness that it would turn up. The other kind of almost more exciting explanation was that Coronzon himself actually turned up. I mean, the spirit force itself turned up to this person and said, I can help you get rid of dark evils. <laughs> because for, funny enough, when you read the actual material around this exorcism, which I didn't include in my book, but the story that goes with it is they're basically trying to get rid of a poltergeist. The description of what was happening in this person's house was bangings and knockings and objects being thrown around. They're talking about a poltergeist. And it's really interesting that they are trying to dispel specifically a poltergeist rather than a demon or anything like that. It's actually designed for that reason. So and one of the things that is also interesting when Dee was basically doing the crystal scrying with Kelly was they had all sorts of strange phenomena happening in their house. Now, they were down in uh, Mortlake, which was the village at the time. It's now part of Greater London. Again, it's hundreds of miles away. And they were recording all sorts of strange noises and lights and odd things going on in the house at the time, which is the kind of thing that we would recognize now as being a poltergeist. But some of the things they described happening were quite spectacular, including the fact that when they were doing a lot of the scrying work, a light would appear from the crystal, which would then go into Edward Kelly's forehead. Edward would be able to see very clearly what was in the crystal until he started complaining of a very, very bad headache. 
And then the light would come out of Kelly's head, go back into the crystal. Dee was seeing all this. And when the light went back into the, the crystal ball, Kelly couldn't remember what he'd been saying and couldn't even read much of what he'd written down. It was too complex. It's one of the strangest elements wow. of the whole and it's amazing and they say it's all written down but it's written down by d in his own personal diaries not for anybody else to ever see so it's not like he was sitting trying to write a story to make lots of money out of it like i was rich already you know he was writing this down for his own record only not for anybody else to ever see it was only for his own interest so you think would you bother making those stories up if you were just writing it down for yourself and he was a very honorable man no doubt about it you know he wasn't the kind of person who would have invented things Edward Kelly, maybe, because he was a bit of a con artist, and one of the things he'd been accused of. Is, there is a story that he had had part of his ears clipped off, which is a punishment for people who do what's called coining, where you, where coins in those days really were made of silver and gold, and you'd cut tiny bits of the coin off, gradually bit by bit, you can collect together an amount of gold, and he'd been caught doing that, and get his ear clipped for doing it. But wow. the things that he was describing seeing in the crystal were the kind of things that Dee understood that Kelly didn't. It was more complex than that. So, you know, if Kelly's making it up himself, he had to have had an incredible memory <laughs> of all the things he was coming up with, including a full, um, proper language, called, now called the Enochian language. The term Enoch comes from later writers. There's a bit of a long story. I won't go into the whole detail of why it's called Enochian, but it's a later thing. As far as Dee was concerned, it was angelic magic. He was talking to angels. So <clears throat> there's a tie-in, then, you see, between my first book, which is my Libra Coronzom, and my new but he shall decay, which is in the form of Mr. Coronzom. Very strange stuff. Wow. I was just going to say, isn't Enochian an angel language? It is. That's the language of the angels. The, basically, one of the things that D thought he was being dictated to him was the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch was a Bible um, book which has been missing for millennia. It was known to have existed but it was in Dee's time thought to have been lost forever. The first actual historic book of Enoch turned up in about the 1700s in Ethiopia, now known as the Ethiopian book of Enoch. There have been a couple of others who've turned up more recently, still going back in time, but more recently there's the, um, there's a Cyrillic one and there's another one. And it's, off, it's on my shelf over there, but it's off the top of my head at the moment. But, and in Dee's time, it was lost. The Book of Enoch didn't exist anymore. It was thought to have been disappeared. And only later was it found. But one of the things that was dictated to Dee, now bear with me, it gets a bit complicated, I'm trying to explain this, was a system of communication, which is the Enochian, now called the Enochian language. And one of the things that was produced are things called the Enochian calls. Now, the idea of the calls themselves is to take your mind to other realms, other realities. Now, we can debate or not whether you really go to the realms or the realms come to you, it's all just in your head. But <clears throat> what they found was that in order to get the cause dictated to them, Dee and Kelly were instructed to, to draw tables of letters, 49 letters by 49 letters, and 49 of them. So you're talking about massive grids of letters. I'm um, sorry, 96 grids of 49 by 49 and one of 96 letters. So you've got these massive grids they had to draw out. They were then told the grid reference number. So, for example, it would be line 15, letter 36 is an A. Write A down. Line 12, grid 15, line 12, letter 5 is a B. Write that down. See, that's how it was done, letter by letter, using the grids. And from that, individual letters given to them backwards were the knocking calls. If you write them down in English forwards, they actually make sense. They are sentences. They have meaning. And it's not the sort of thing that the Elizabethan brain could have invented. Just a brain. You'd need a computer to be able to create this thing, to know how to create the grids to create the cause and there's 49 calls and it is just incredible there's just and, and they did all this in the space of a month they were given just one month to do all this now what d thought he was being given was the missing book of enoch hence the enochian name that's where that comes from but what he was given it's been called liba Lagoeth, which is this grid and then you have the enochian cause which as mad as it sounds, some people have found just reading them gives them a headache. Not as hard work to read, but starts to feel kind of weird and odd vibration feelings around them. Now, you can easily argue it's all imagination, no doubt about that. But right. the way it was constructed, 
itself is the big mystery. It's just incredible. You have, as I say, you have these 49 calls, which are given one letter at a time backwards from the grids by the angel, angelic forces that Dee and Kelly were communicating with. Mad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it kind of just fried my little brain. Yeah. <laughs> I hope people are, 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 are keeping up with this. Oh, I'm sorry if I've lost everybody. Right, it's it's just, not unusual for me to lose uh, people. <laughs> no, but I'm trying to think of, of, like you said, 49, but 49, and then that would be one hell of a massive grid. How You couldn't right. do it. Were you? Exactly. They were absolutely huge. And funnily enough, there's a new book that's just been published, which is a collection of all of these diaries, the complete record of everything, including all the grids. Now, they've been available as a PDF, actual photographs or microfilms of these actual diary entries have been available for a number of years. But, I mean, I've got them. And when I wrote my book, that's what I was working with, is the microfiche images of the D, actual handwritten diaries. And it's hard working places. I'll be honest with you. He was writing very quickly. Obviously, a lot of information is flooding through quite fast. Someone that he sat down, a guy called Kevin Klein, has transcribed, and we're talking about over a 1,000 pages of it, including the massive grids. And it's literally just come out. And it's um, sitting on my shelf now, as we speak. It's bloody huge. It's a two-volume set, actually, in a box. But um, that's incredible that someone's gone to that length to actually bring all this stuff out in an easy, readable form. And it's amazing. So, wow. Now, it depends on who you're talking to, whether it's an easy, readable form or not. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Certainly a bit easier to read than the medieval oh, 1500s handwriting in a high speed trying to get everything down in one go. These are well uh, to read. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just looked at that and went, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have been like, I got nothing. Nothing, yeah. nothing. Can somebody read that to me as a bedtime story? We only got about <laughs> two minutes left. Now, let's talk about your book again, and they can pre-order it. Yes. My book is entitled The Wicked Shirley K. You can get it, say, on pre-order from Amazon. They launched, I think it says, early next year, but I know Three Hands Press will be available from them slightly earlier, providing nothing goes wrong and there's no delays or anything, problems like that. We've had, you know, had a few kind of things that to sort out to make some slight changes, but uh, generally speaking, it's kind of pretty much ready to go. So, I say, The Wicked Shell Decay by A.D. Mercer, my official um, writing name, <laughs> can be found via Amazon. Obviously, I'll stick stuff on Facebook and all the likes when it actually does finally emerge. So, there we go. I thought perhaps, um, just before we finish, if you like, I can read off another couple of spells and charms, if you like. They're actually in the book. Uh, if you might have about one, one minute, minute left or so, if you want to get a quick one in, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. I can just quickly find the last one. Oh, hello. That's fun. I had a great one. Of course, I've chosen to change the screen. I've lost the bloody one. <laughs> Typical. Typical <laughs> oh, come on. Where's it going? Oh, that's a nice one I was going to read. Oh, ah, where's it going? Typical. Absolutely typical. Um, never mind. Never mind. Well, there we go. Um, oh, here you go. There you go. To ask for the devil's help with the transfiguration of a woman into a hair. Say the following, when we go into the shape of a hair, say I shall go into the hair with sorrow and sick and milky care, and I shall go into by the devil's name, and will I come out home again? So evoking the power of the devil to become a hair. And with that, wow. we'll have to say good night, <laughs> folks. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. <laughs> no problem. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.